Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Um, We've heard a lot this morning about the opportunity of smart cities and the technologies that can change people's lives who live in cities. The next panel that we're going to discuss is all about 5G, the fifth generation of mobile networks, and the promise that brings to enhance that 5G, enhance that smart city technology even further. So we're going to have a discussion today with um, my fellow panelists. We have Vasil Latsanich, who is the CEO of Russian carrier Vimpelcom. We have Alicia Manchenio. She is the managing director of Alizant Spain. And we have John Sung Huan, who is a lead researcher at the National Information Society Agency and master planner of the Busan. So just to kick things off, I just want to outline for, for the audience the potential promise of 5G. So this is the next generation of mobile technology that phone carriers are preparing to roll out globally. It promises to bring download speeds that are potentially a thousand times faster than 4G. Now keep in mind, smart cities have already been developing as you've heard. And a lot of these technologies are operating on 4G or NB IoT networks. So, What's the potential for 5G? I'm going to put this to our panelists. Alicia, in your former role as, um, at Vodafone, you worked a lot in Spain with the development of smart cities there. And so this has been going on for years. And you've been working with communities using NBIOT networks and 4G networks. Can you outline for us what are the applications that cities have already been able to develop with 4G and NB-IoT, and then looking forward at 5G, where is that distinction? What, what can 5G promise that 4G and NB-IoT cannot? Uh, in, in fact, um, M2N communications that they are used for smart cities have been around even for 4G or NB-IoT. NB-IoT was launched something like three or four years ago, and a little bit earlier, 4G was launched. But before that, we, you could use 2G, 3G, or any other um, low-range communications like Sigfox or LoRa, for example. So um, most of the ab early applications of uh, smart cities that were based on sensoring, like uh, smart parking, smart waste, or uh, tr traffic sensors, these kind of things, they could transmit very very little data, and they wouldn't need even for 4G. Um, so uh, this is what has happened in Madrid at the beginning, and also in many other cities in Spain. For example, in Santander, that was one of the first cities that got European funds to have a big project. They deployed 12,000 sensors in a, in a moment where even 4G wasn't available. So they were, most of them were using uh, Sigfox or even cables. You don't need uh, to have m any other communications. Uh, if I could just interrupt you for a moment. Alicia yeah. is talking about the city of northern city of Santander deploying s sensors across the city. Now, where would these sensors be placed? On, on what kinds of infrastructure would these sensors be placed? And what kind of information would that provide and, and applications? Uh, the, the most part of them were uh, to in the waste uh, containers, mm -hmm. so that the company, the private company that was in charge of collecting the waste, they would know where the, the containers were full, and they could collect them and improve the collection of waste. And then there are lighting sensors to know when to switch on and off the street lights, for example, uh, street sensors for the roads to know how many vehicles moved around the city, uh, parking sensors for knowing if there are free parking spaces in the city. This kind of very, now you see them as very basic applications. At that time, that was like 10 years ago, it seemed very advanced, but now it's fairly easy and not so much uh, value added. So a lot, of, a lot of sensors to help with waste collection, with street lighting, with that kind of thing. Yeah. Now, now, where can 5G play a role to change the city? Where does 5G make the difference? I, I would say um, some of the city services were improved. So the first thing that the, the city hall managed was to save money. 
So the city, the citizens' life would change if la, if uh, this m extra money would, was used was in a better way, because the, the first uh, the first idea was to optimize the city operations. Then the second thing is for traffic or parking, the citizens could improve their lives if they would stop less, spend less time in their cars or in their roads. For me, what this was. Um, uh, the, the downside of this uh, concept was that each of the services, like waste management, lighting management, and so on, was conceived as a silo application. So the, the information didn't cross from one place to another, so it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be used to have a bigger view, of, a broader view of the city. Okay, so, very interesting. Um, John Sung, when you think about the city of Busan, which is the second largest city in South Korea, this is this is supposed to be a model city, sm model smart city, you know, dealing with all sorts of issues like reducing pollution in the water, um, helping to promote a, the youth to stay in the city and not move to Seoul. So trying to create a, a, an urban environment that's attractive, an attractive place for people to live. Um, as you're planning this, I understand that it's it's not due to launch until 2021. So you may have the opportunity to take advantage of some of that 5G technology. Can you walk us through what are the opportunities that you see for Busan? Where are the where are the parts of the city where you're looking to use technology to change people's lives? Yeah, uh, we think uh, 5G, 5G uh, will be uh, quite different from uh, previous technology. So 5G, uh, so previous mobile technology is for uh, human, yeah. human users. But 5G uh, can, uh, so actually 5G can be used by machine. So uh, at the moment, so uh, we, I think we don't, uh, we don't have a so big problem uh, if we use 4G or uh, so previous technology for a human ser uh, service for human. But if we want to use uh, machines, so uh, especially fast moving uh, machines with very uh, so I would say, uh, high stake uh, jump, machine, jump machines, then uh, we need very secure and uh, fast so uh, connectivity. And one more thing is that uh, so previous session I uh, talk about this. So, uh, so machines uh, w when we uh, use uh, intelligent machine, there are two options. One is we make a machine do all the functions alone. Uh, that is a very uh, smart machines. The other option is to. Uh, so machine connected with uh, so infrastructure and get additional uh, support uh, from outside. So the second option uh, is the approach we uh, take uh, when we build a pilot city, a smart, a smart pilot smart city. So uh, in order to uh, make a connect, uh, connected car, connected robot, uh, connected something, then we need a 5G uh, network. So the most beautiful aspect of 5G is, is that it, uh, it, it brings together uh, uh, from uh, different sources, uh, 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 bring together uh, resources, data and computing power and anything from different sources. And it can make those things work as a single unit. So previous technology uh, cannot do that. Uh, so uh, that, 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 that's, the tech, uh, that's the position we have. Sure. I was reading a speech by the Korean president, uh, Moon Jae-in, in February, talking about Busan and, and the promise that this smart city is supposed to bring for citizens. And some of the things he was saying was, you know, they're going to save, save 124 hours a year. The idea that you could save time in your life by reducing the daily commute you know, using technology to prevent traffic jams, um, you know, save five hours waiting in hospitals because maybe you can get, maybe you can get healthcare services over the phone, um, creating a notification system for disasters such as earthquakes, these kinds of things. Um, Vasil, I'm interested in hearing about Vimplecom and your plans in Russia. I understand the, the brand is known as Beeline, has signed an agreement with some Russian 
regions to develop smart city infrastructure. Can you walk us through how you're thinking about smart cities as a company, whether it's with 4G and BIOT or looking ahead to 5G? Well, our main task is the enabler, is the enabler to let businesses, let social environments develop and make better life for people. So, in fact, what we are doing right now with these uh, signings with the regions, and we encourage more and more regions to step into it, is, hey guys, there is our network. It can do much more than just connect people. This is exactly what was just said, that the new technologies are enabling more and more non-human to human connections, but also they are carrying more and more information. So what we believe is crucial and a very interesting as the new product development for the socials, for the governments, for the businesses, is how do we work with the new type of connections and with the information that these connections generate. So in those regions that we mentioned, we are signing contracts and signing cooperation agreements on how we develop the information knowledge about the people, about the machines, about the happenings in those regions, and how do we enable that with the technologies available from Beeline on network and off network. And here off network is crucial because for many, many years we've, we've been processing tons of information on network, but we were not really, as the carriers, able to analyze it and provide products based on this information. And we call it off network because it means using the information, we try to calculate the patterns, calculate the the situations on the network based on people information and machine information and produce an IT product out of that, not necessarily the network product out of that. The question is about 4G and 5G here. So the 4G currently satisfies all the known needs of the society, meaning literally the connectivity of human to human, connectivity between the machines and connectivity for the data collection and processing. The 5G is, so far as we take it very technically and very critically, as someone's who need to invest billions into it, we take it as an opportunity to develop something new. And if you ask me right now, what would be the applications, what would be the use cases, what would be the benefits of launching 5G, I can tell you. I have some daydreaming type of ideas, but I don't have the dead, sure business cases for this. So I'd say that 5G is a potential enabler for potentially new services of which we know very little yet. And if you ask me about the things that we do with the regions, whether we need 5G in order to make these things happen, not at all. 4G is well enough. But as it happened several years ago when we were launching 4G, in majority of the cases, the 4G was launched ahead of actual products being developed for 4G. So it, it was launched as the environment, and then this environment enabled the development and crafting of new products that could be bringing and are bringing some new experiences and new abilities to the society. So we believe this will be pretty much the same case when we will launch the network. And based on that new network, new type of speed, latency, availability of the signal, number of devices that can be connected to that network, People, I mean developers, businesses, governments will request and develop new applications. The carriers are there to make the carriage working. The businesses, the developers, the bright minds are there to use that. So we will be, I'm sure, one of the first ones in the country to enable that network. And then we will very much hope, same as you, that there will be enough of bright minds to use it. Now, it sounds to me like you don't want to wait for 5G for these smart cities to develop. You, you want to go ahead and, and look at the technologies that already exist and try to benefit as much as you can from those technologies. However, we know that 5G rollouts are starting. We're seeing carriers globally acquire the spectrum that they need, and some of them are starting to build out their networks in different places. So just speaking to you know, where each of you are playing a role in the smart city, I'd like to hear what the 5G landscape is looking like. So John Sung, I know in Korea, you have some question marks around 
5G availability? And how are you actually going to negotiate rates and prices to accommodate the smart city? So can you speak a little bit about the challenges that you're facing and some of the questions you need answered before you can bring in 5G into your plans? Uh, yes, uh, you, uh, we are now facing uh, many issues in applying 5G to uh, our uh, smart city project. So in terms of B2C, uh, 5G, uh, I think, is ready to use. But in terms of B2B, there are so many issues to solve. So uh, for instance, infrastructure. So uh, 5G need very so the, the, the dense the network of so uh, so base station and access point. So uh, especially indoor, indoor infrastructure are also very critical uh, to uh, developing service. So uh, who will uh, who will invest for that infrastructure? Uh, we can wait until our market uh, can market invest uh, market decide to invest. Uh, and make those infrastructure. But uh, in some uh, cities, uh, we don't have enough time uh, to wait until the market uh, responds. Another issue is a price. So uh, B2B, uh, B2B, uh, so, uh, so, so, company, so telephone companies uh, so just want to very small discount. But well, what, you want, uh, what you want is not just a dis discount. So uh, we want a quite new business model. So a local 5G, uh, we are seriously, uh, seriously thinking about uh, building a local 5G or a private 5G. But uh, local 5G and private 5G, so, um, so a little different, but we can use uh, so interchangeably. So local 5G, uh, so telephone companies are very so hard to worry about. Uh, the lo local 5G idea. And so the, so the, would that be the idea of cutting out the phone carrier or having them build it for you so it's a private network? Maybe you can explain what you mean by a local 5G. Yeah, local 5G, uh, yes, so uh, they, were, uh, they were a commercial public network uh, uh, built and operated by uh, telephone companies. But uh, like a private network, so we can build uh, so a 5G network within certain uh, within certain areas. So that uh, air, that 5G network can be built by the telephone companies or can be built by users. Uh? So, but uh, there are many regula uh, re regulation related issues and business related issues. Another big thing is timing, timing. So B2C. Uh, so uh, we have a 5G uh, smartphone, so any, any, anyone, so in Korea, so people can use 5G, but we don't have 5, 5G chips. So uh, we need to develop 5G-enabled machine, 5G-enabled devices, but uh, in the market, there is no 5G chips at all. So we are now talking with uh, so Samsung and Qualcomm, and that Qualcomm, uh, Qualcomm promised to uh, supply 5G chips, but um, yeah, maybe <laughs> it is very early time. Yeah. So uh, at this moment, so uh, there are there are huge, uh, there are big uncertainty uh, regarding 5G. But anyway, uh, our project is to solve those issues and settle down those issues. Okay. So uh, we will try our best. Yeah. Now, Vassil, in Russia, you're undergoing a challenge actually accessing the airwaves that you need, the spectrum that you need as a carrier to roll out 5G. Can you walk us through the discussion there in terms of accessing that spectrum and what your expectations are in Russia with regards to timing and how that's all going to roll out? Well, it's very complicated. There's many things happening here. The frequencies that the telecom carriers need pretty much all around the globe are called C-bands. The C-band is a three point something megahertz spectrum that is most widely utilized for 5G deployments worldwide. There are more than 30 networks already launched on these frequencies. These frequencies in Russia, alike in many other countries actually, are used for various military and special services needs. In order to make 
social use of these frequencies, they need to be converted. So we need to go through conversion. We've done that many times already. We need to do it again. It just uh, every time it slows down the process and every time it gets complicated in the beginning. But then we as a society managed to solve it sooner or later. Every time we faced it with 2G, then with 3G development, then with 4G development, everything was pretty much, if not the same, then in the same area of magnitude of complexity. So with 3G, the licenses, the frequencies are not available for licensing in the moment. We are adamant that this is the only set of frequencies we need to start off with. There are certain ex extensions into so-called four point something frequencies and into millimeter band wave, but those would be extensions and additions to the core frequency of C band, which I mentioned before. We very much hope that the whole social development and political support will enable these frequencies to be available to the businesses to start off building the networks somewhere next year. And that will be just the beginning because obviously conversion takes time. So the first batches that would be made available to the businesses would be insufficient to, ca to cater for all of the existing businesses and all of the existing potential clients. So we are probably talking about a phasing of first step going into the business with some limited frequencies and then developing them along the way uh, in course of a couple of years. But we are that sure that, that this needs to be in the C band for the beginning and then developing into further bands and extending into existing uh, spectrums as long as the chipsets, technologies, the end user devices become available. Sounds like a lot more conversations need to happen with government and the military in Russia to sort out Definitely. how to move forward. So we touched a little bit earlier on the, the idea of who builds the network. Is it a private network? Is it a public network? And there's a big question mark around 5G and smart cities about who makes money off of this. And obviously, the phone carriers want to play a critical role. Um, but I'm curious whether the panelists think they can play a bigger role than connectivity, just simple connectivity. So, Alicia, when you were working at Vodafone in Spain, you were working with communities on coming up with a plan that they could model their 5G, or sorry, model their smart city after. Can you speak a little bit about what role you see the telecom carrier playing, and how do they actually monetize the opportunity? Yeah, in fact, in any communications, the communications part is shrinking the, the size of the value chain they are getting out of it. So uh, Vodafone and yeah, Vodafone and also I, I've learned that some carriers in, in in Russia are thinking the same. They want to move from being just the comms provider into a higher, bigger role. Um, first of all, if you of course have data of your users, this is something that no one else can have, and you can use it for commercial issues, but also for smart cities, as, uh, emergency issues, learning uh, patterns on how people move in the streets, how you can improve your tra public transport. So there are many uses of the data that telecom operators have that could be of use for smart cities. So it sounds like, if I could just interrupt you, it sounds like the telecom carrier's role having ownership over the data yeah. and, and access to all the data is a critical piece of it and sort of playing a role as an aggregator and bringing together all the different service providers is also another piece of it. Yeah, exactly. So apart from that, which is your role as it is, um, when you go to a, a small town hall that they don't have so many means as resources, uh, the telecom operator can be, behave as an aggregator of different applications, different providers, sensor providers, or data providers as well, and to de deliver a full service. And not a project, but a service to the city, uh, using several sources of services at, at the so same time. Almost acting like a consultant or a project manager for the city? Uh, I I even further, because a consultant gives their work and leave, a project manager does a project and leaves, a, a comms operator could be an operator not only of comms, but the smart city, so we could call it the smart city operator for the long term. So, Vassal, I'd, I'd love to close with your view, just as the CEO of a telecom carrier, um, you've already expressed some skepticism about 5G. If we could just speak bigger picture about smart cities, whether it's 4G or NB-IoT, 
Where do you see the opportunity to monetize? You're obviously going out and building these relationships with cities, hoping that there is a business case there. Do you have clarity yet on what role the telecom carrier can play in order to make some money off of this? Well, historically, our business was a little bit of chain of leaps of faith. It means that we didn't have a good chance to calculate what would be the payback for 4G when we launched it. We didn't have that chance even for 3G. There were some ideas, but not a real good solid business case. And we don't have that for 5G. And that has never prevented us from building the networks. So it is not skepticism. It is very informed realism that I'm talking about. I'm seeing that we don't know what for yet. But I'm sure that we will be building, we will be investing, we will make that available, and we will again see the new businesses developing, be it in a person-to-person -person type of relationships or person-to-city or city-to-city -city type of relationships. And we are sure that this will be yet unknown and a very needed in the course of the next couple of years on the 5G environments. Just to reflect back on the 4G, when we launched the 4G, there were no products but there were ideas. Many of those ideas did not happen to be products. But the new products that we never thought about have emerged through the 4G development. It will be just the same with the 5G. We are now talking about smart cities, autonomous vehicles, medicine, garbage business. We don't know whether, whether these will be exactly what will need 5G. But we are sure that there will be need for 5G, and we are there to build this technology to give these opportunities to the businesses and people. It sounds like, despite all the question marks and uncertainty, there is a whole lot of optimism about what opportunities 5G can bring, particularly with smart cities. Can we get a round of applause for our panelists? Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.